Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us for our AOCF webinar Wednesday. I'm Amy Guerin, Director of Brand and Digital Strategy at AOCF, and I'm really excited today to um, have this webinar with Eric or Rick Steiner, as he's better known, Technical Applications Manager for Ivonet Corporation. He's going to um, teach us today how to make presentations engaging and memorable. Um, so I think this will all be very applicable to, to all of us um, as we hope to communicate better. To introduce Rick, he has a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a master's in physical chemistry. He worked in formulation development since 1990 before narrowing his focus to product development and surfactant in 2004. Rick has been a wonderful volunteer for AOCS for many years and has served as the program committee chair for the AOCS annual meeting um, for the past few years, as well as this one, and generally presents one or two times per AOCS meeting since around 2006. Although his role is in product and application development, he has found that the ability to give effective presentations is vital to a technologist's career development. He has been on multiple podcasts as a guest, as well as webinars like this one, and is generally considered to be someone who brings a great deal of excitement, interest, and enthusiasm to any presentation. So happy to have this webinar for you today. Participants are muted, so should you have any questions, please write them in the chat box and we will address those at the end of the webinar. Um, so Rick, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Amy, and I really appreciate the kind introduction as well. Um, and I want to thank also uh, you and AOCS for, for having me and letting me uh, speak on this topic because I, as you mentioned, I think it's very important and it is something that can really augment all of our careers. I don't care what you're doing, but uh, the ability to communicate what you're doing really is a key part of that. And I won't say that I'm an expert at all. I've been told I do a pretty good job. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is I'd share basically the strategies and the tools and the techniques that I've developed over the years in order to put together what I think are generally pretty, pretty good presentations. Um, and for some reason, I'm not forwarding. Let me try again. There we go. Okay. So, first off, let's start with uh, with an agenda. Uh, I always start off a presentation with the agenda, and this is no uh, this is no exception to that rule. Uh, one of the things that you'll hear people tell you regarding making presentations is that you need to first tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you just told them. And I'm sure that everybody has heard that, but I'll tell you, it's it really is an important. Uh, script to follow as you try and uh, and come up with a good presentation. And I found that coming up with an agenda, which is basically saying this is what I'm about to tell you, is a really good place to start. And it's not only about basically taking the ideas and putting them before the the person who is going to be listening to your presentation, but there's more to it than just that. There is. Um, a little bit more that we're going to touch on in, in some of the next slides. But for right now, let's talk about what we're intending to do today. Uh, first of all, we're going to get some starting assumptions out of the way. And I want to address why you, as a technologist, want to make presentations. Because surely you're not a people person, otherwise you wouldn't be in technology, right? Uh, that's a joke, just in case anyone thinks that I'm, I'm throwing shade their way. Um, and then, of course, we're going to talk about building the presentation and polishing the presentation, which really is part of building the presentation, but I consider it to be a second step that helps to clarify and make things a little bit better. And as far as uh, once you finish the polishing of the presentation and you rehearse the presentation, a vital step that I think could be done a little bit more frequently, even by me, uh, then you have to make the presentation. And we're going to talk about the ways that those come across and the ways that, that you can use 
props, we'll call them, and tools, and how you can look at the audience and decide whether or not you're going down the right road and whether or not you're actually managing to uh, present the information you intend to or if you're losing your audience. So let's talk about Rick, these starting uh, Sorry, Rick. Uh, speaking of being able to uh, see and uh, know your audience or your speaker, did you intend to share your webcam now? Oh, I didn't. I, I did not. And actually, thanks for bringing that up. Um, as a matter of fact, it, it, it's not shared, is it? It is not. Good, because I want to. I want to spare everyone the the torture of having to look at my face as I go through this until it's absolutely okay. necessary. <laughs> but thanks for checking. Sure. I, yes, thanks very much. And th and and I, in fact, I'll go ahead and mention that once we get to the part where we're talking about giving the presentation, I am going to turn my webcam on, and um, and actually show you what I'm talking about and some of the things that I'm discussing. And I'm, I'm going to apologize up front and say it's not a great resolution webcam. It's the best we can do with uh, the bandwidth that we've got right now. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that when we get there. But it, but let's go back to the starting assumptions. And that is basically you're going to prepare a presentation to share technical information. That means basically you're a technologist and you have a short amount of time, generally less than an hour, in order to expose your research to the rest of the world and to make it worthwhile that people are listening to you. I'm also going to assume that you're using PowerPoint or similar presentation software. The following discussion focuses on Microsoft Office's PowerPoint. I'm not getting paid by them. There are plenty of other software packages that'll do the same thing, like Apple Keynote, Google Slides, um, Open Office has got something that will do something very similar. They're all very typical in terms of the tools that they present you. I'm not going to talk about some of the newer things out there that I've learned about that are more cloud-based applications that are supposed to be more multimedia. To be honest, I don't think that a technical presentation along the lines of what we would typically, typically present lend themselves particularly well to multimedia types of things although we can spice things up a little bit. And I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Now, here is the caveat. And this the caveat here is that I'm going to be talking about things and I'm going to be giving suggestions and I'm going to be giving some rules and I'm going to be breaking a lot of them. And the reason why is that this presentation is not the kind that we're talking about. Um, I'm giving you more of a conversational how-to type of presentation as opposed to I am conveying my research. And that, by necessity, takes a little bit of a different approach. Similarly, if you were going to be giving, say, a three-hour talk in a training session, if you were going to be giving a day-long class, again, you'd really want to follow some different uh, techniques. This does give you some ideas and some points that you can use in those types of situations, but really I'm, I'm trying to drill into the kind of talk that you'd give at the AOCS annual meeting, for example. And once again, hey, I think I'm figuring it out. Okay, so why? Why do you wanna make a presentation? I'm going to be absolutely selfish and say that the reason that you need to make a presentation is for you. It's because nobody knows who you are. They don't know your value. And if they don't know your value, it means that you cannot then turn around and give them the information and the work that you've been spending your time on and that interests you. If you're in an academic setting and you're looking for grants, you're the first step of that. It's not the research you're doing. You're the one who's selling it. In effect, you're selling yourself and your ability to make these presentations. If you're trying to sell a product or you're trying to gain recognition within your company, it's you first that needs to be recognized. And then your work can highlight what you as a person and a researcher and a technologist can do. So basically the idea is that if you want to share your ideas, you're going to have to sell them. And the first step is selling yourself. And so you put yourself out in front. And as you keep doing that, you're going to make connections. And let me tell you, I, I have learned connections are what it's all about. So that's why you need to be working on making presentations. Oh, now wait. It looks like the intellectual property rights attorney has jumped into my presentation. And uh, 
what I'm what I'm tossing this in right off the bat is that I want to tell you that one of the easiest ways that you can make a point with a presentation is by using images and graphics files. And if you do nothing else, I want you to know about image rights because that guy that's on the right, who we've got his picture of, I have no idea who he is. I have no idea what he really is interested in and what he's doing, and he has no idea he's in my presentation right now. So do I have permission to use that photo? Well, it is in the public domain, and that typically means that it can be used. The same with the property rights attorney who's yelling at me. But you need to make sure. So before we go any further, I want you to be careful with the images and graphics. Because if you're making a public presentation, people may know who owns that photo, and they may get a little touchy about it. If you typically get images online, and that's a really easy place to get them, make sure you're using the right search tool in order to get the things that you can use. And I'm going to show you how. And that is first for Google, but it's the same with a lot of other things. Bing has got something very similar. This is your process. First of all, you go to your image search page and you click on your tools, which is right there. Then it will drop down a bar, one of which is a filter on usage rights. Click on that. Now you have a filter that allows you to filter according to what types of usage rights are available. And I typically would go with labeled for reuse with modification because I'm generally going to play around with the images a little bit. Maybe I'll crop them. Maybe I'll add something to them. Maybe I'll take something out of them. So that is the way that you make sure that you're doing this well. Now, you may also want to use images that have been attributed, attributed to someone else. And we'll talk about that when we get there, because I've done that too. Now, now that I've scared you about intellectual property rights and presentations, let's talk about how we're going to build it. And even before you start putting your slides together, I want you to start thinking. I want you to do your homework. And what I mean by that is think about what the goal of your presentation is. Is your goal going to be to sell a product? Is it going to be to try and provide the information on your research because the rest of your group wants to know that you're what you're working on? Are you looking for a job and you're trying to get people to take note of the new and interesting things that you're doing in the lab? All of these can add a little bit of a substantial influence to how you present your information. And so I want you to put it in your head right off the bat, what am I doing here? Now, the next question is, who's your audience? And that is important. Now, in the AOCS annual meeting, you've generally got a pretty good idea who your audience is, but I'm going to tell you an embarrassing story about how I learned why you always need to know who your audience is. Basically, I had been invited to give a presentation on biodegradable surfactants. And without going into exactly why, I had it in my head I was going to be speaking to end users of the surfactants, meaning beginner formulators, maybe industrial laundry managers who were dealing with wastewater, things like that. And so that's how I crafted my presentation. Unfortunately, I found out at the end of the presentation that I was actually speaking to a group of surfactant scientists. So the information I shared was kind of pointless. They already knew everything that I talked about. And even worse, I used some sweeping generaliz generalizations that you would use with people who were not professionals in the area. And I was corrected afterwards by a few guys. It was very embarrassing to me. And in fact, it was embarrassing to my hosts as well. I have never been invited back to that particular venue to give another talk. And I'm sure that this was why. So always know who you're going to be presenting to. Now, the other thing is, think about what is your venue? Where are you going to be? And what types of uh, in environment are you going to be in? Are you going to be able to get up and move around? Are you going to have a microphone? Are you going to have uh, an ability to show big slides? Or are you going to be something, uh, are you going to be doing something uh, completely different? It's just get it in your head what it is so that you can be prepared for exactly what you're going to be talking about. And now the next part is what story do you want to tell? Because this is a story. It's a story about you. It's a story about your research. 
if you're just going to go in to give just a bunch of facts and a bunch of results from the lab, you're not going to keep people's attention. We're wired to listen to stories. This is the reason why, you know, even if you watch the news or if you watch a nature show on TV, they have a story embedded in the, in the, in the story that they're talking about. We want to hear stories. We don't just want to hear facts. And then identify the key points. Because if we're going to keep taking the, the story analogy down this road, basically I want you to stick with the key facts or the key points. Focus on your big reveal. This is the turning point of the story. And really it's your conclusion. It's, it's what you came up with, your data analysis. But we also want to know what path took you there. How did you test? How did you get your data? All those types of things. And when you tell us about the path, I want you to Talk about something else. Don't give us the data that got generated. Talk about how this path generated a different set of data that we can all agree on so that we know about your path. Because that way, when it's applied to the big reveal, everybody is kind of in on the story and paying attention to the conclusion. Tell people where the path began. Why are you interested? Why is this an interesting thing? Because if you're not interested, then nobody else is going to be interested either. And I suspect you're interested anyway. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing your job. If, if you're not interested, I'm sorry, and I hope you get a better job. But hopefully you are interested. And you also want to set the stage for the story. This is about two minutes, and people don't do it nearly enough. Because even though we're all scientists, we're scientists in different areas. And I want to know what type of scientist you are and what kind of concepts we're going to be playing with as we move forward. Now, for example... I'm focused in surfactants. So if someone comes up and they say, I'm going to tell you about surfactants, well, that's great. But I want to know, are they talking about interfacial phenomena? Are they talking about aggregation characteristics? Are they talking about emulsification? This matters a little bit because it, it helps me get my head where it needs to be. And moving ahead, let's talk about building the presentation. The first thing is the agenda, because it's not just to set the uh, thought about what we're going to be talking about, it's also going to help you be guided in determining what you're putting into your presentation. So take your agenda or your outline or your synopsis or your skeleton, whatever it is, write it out first. That's the very first thing you do. And that agenda I showed you, that was the first thing I wrote. Now it's changed a good bit because it will change. But that led me in developing the rest of the presentation. If you're going to use a template for background formatting, do it now. <laughs> so I am lucky enough that I have a template that I am supposed to use every time. Now, this isn't quite Evonics work. Um, this is more them allowing me to do something. Um, and so I don't have the Evonic template. But I'll tell you, 99% of the time that I put together a presentation, I'm using their template. And so that means the formats are always going to be the same. If for some reason you change your formatting and you want to recycle things back and forth, be aware that your format's going to change to whatever PowerPoint thinks makes the most sense. And it's generally not the right thing. So you're going to have to be doing some switching. So the best thing is to choose a template or set up a background formatting that you'll use again and again as you present. Now, you've got your slides. Let's fill in the blanks. With what? Well, <laughs> bullet lists are common, but they're also pretty boring. Having said that, you'll notice that's what's on this page because they also do a really good job of conveying information. Sometimes that's the best way to do it. Uh, consider the fact that a lot of times we're sharing these presentations to people who couldn't come, who need these for future reference, who want to take notes on them. And so bullet charts are very helpful for those types of things. But also bear in mind that bullet lists can be distracting because as you show that to the audience, they're not paying attention to you. They're paying attention to those bullets and they're reading it while you're talking. So some people will say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have my individual bullets appear on the screen as I talk to those bullet points. And that can be annoying because you're talking to smart people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be giving a technical presentation. And that's like spoon feeding them. Even worse is if you read the bullet list point by point, you'll notice that I didn't do that. And generally, I don't. Uh, I may hammer on something, but I'm not going to read it to you because I'm not going to insult your intelligence. 
So my point is, bullet points have their place, but don't rely on them. Don't count on them to be everywhere and do everything. Oh, but there are exceptions, and we'll talk about that too. Speaking of which, I think humor is good. Use humor, but don't be the kind of presenter that uses humor to the extent that you're going to see this guy's presentation so that you can laugh. Because even though the data may be great, if the humor takes away from it, you've missed your mark. So be, be friendly, don't be a comedian. Instead of using a bullet point though, maybe you can use something evocative because pictures are worth a thousand words. What I love to do is put a picture up or, or a graph or a chart and talk about what this tells us because it starts getting people's wheels turning and they start buying in to what you're talking about. Once you put this all together, it's time to polish. Start by clarifying your charts. Look at your charts. Are they telling you anything? Or is there too much information? This chart right here is something I consider to be a very poor chart. And I'll also say I'm the one that made it long ago. Didn't know what I was doing. But seriously, I, the whole point is that there's too much information on there. I've got two sides of the same coin, and that's why I put them together. I thought, oh, hey, you know, this is a good way to put it. But you'll notice that there are axes on both sides, on the right and the left, and sometimes that's confusing. Now, of course, you can, you can explain it and you can talk about it and draw people into the understanding of this chart. But an easier thing is to either prepare them for the chart that's coming so that they can immediately understand what is on the screen in front of them, or simplify it to the point where they don't need to have that pre-understanding in order to grasp the concepts. People like to think, and they like to feel like they're a part of the discovery process in finding out what's going on in your given presentation. When you do put on your chart, make sure it's readable. Is it too small of a font? Are the axes, axes labeled properly? Uh, you know, we don't even know what that is on the left. And is it, is it simply too busy? Do you try to put so much information into a chart that it doesn't make as much sense to someone? So let me throw some, some other ideas that might help to clarify without having to make things busy. One thing you can do is that you can use different colors for your data. So you can call out a different set as you're putting those, those data points onto your chart. Or another one is here on an FTIR scan where the person who put this together has actually identified what we're seeing in, in this particular scan. And in that way, we get a better understanding. So as you do this, make sure that you're using these in a good fashion. And also, going back to the images, make sure that you're clear to use them. Review your images in presentation mode to ensure that they're clear, they're not pixelated or anything like that. And don't clutter your slide. Those three images that I put together, that was about as much as I would ever put on a slide. And even I thought that was a little too much. I was just trying to get, get a concept there. Make sure there's a reason why you're using them. There's a reason why you're talking to those images or that they're emphasizing, clarifying, or directing people's attention regarding what is actually on that slide. For a while, it seemed like every presentation I saw had these generic people images. That just drove me nuts. Why are they there? They're there because someone wanted to put something artsy on their slide and they didn't really care too much about what it was. Don't, don't be like that. Be thoughtful and be clear. Oh, last thing. If an image makes your gut clench, don't use it. And this is just going to one of those things. Sometimes something looks weird. If it looks weird to you, it's going to look weird to other people. Just don't use it. Sometimes there's something funky in the background, maybe a swirl of colors or something that, that is, it's just too much. So if, if there's an image that you don't like, just don't bother with it because like I said, others won't like it either. Now suppose you use an image that does belong to someone. Well, you can footnote it directly on your slide as we see right here. Or at the end of your presentation, you can use a resources slide where which it lists where you took all of your information that was not specifically generated by your own work. 
sometimes you can do both. If you're giving the kind of presentation that you know that people are going to be very interested in following up on what you have presented, that resources slide at the end can be really helpful in pointing them in the right direction. And having the footnote slide in addition to that, that actually specifies which one of those resources at the end is tied to that slide. Either way is, is going to work reasonably well. The point is to know about the venue that you're at. And do they have a specific way that they want intellectual property that's shared to be identified? So do make sure that you check those. That's part of knowing your venue so that you know how to present that, that type of information. And maybe you want some animations or videos, but don't overdo it. Because your motion is going to catch your interest. It's, it's just the reason why it's, we're wired the way that we are. We're out in the, the wild thousands of years ago, and we're trying to stay safe. And if something moves, we want to know what that is. And that continues today. If there's motion, the attention is drawn to it. Too much motion, on the other hand, and you start to become immune to it, kind of like vegging out on the couch as you watch television. So don't overdo it. Keep it there and continue to use it. And also remember, animation can take up a considerable amount of memory on your computer. It can cause your computer to slow down. Um, that can be a problem. The other thing is that it won't come across in a static format. That first slide that I had with that IP lawyer guy on it, if I turn that into a PDF file or if I print it out, you're not going to be able to read that slide because that IP lawyer guy is in front of everything. And in fact, before I share these slides, maybe I should take that off. So I'll make a note of that. And remember what I said earlier, we want to be able to slide to uh, share this information a lot of times. So you want your slides to, even if they have those animations, don't have them cross over each other so that you can no longer see the base slide. Here are some basic rules. And I think that I, uh, I think I touched on those in the uh, earlier slide. But I'll also mention one thing that's a good way to use animation, and that is sometimes you feel like because of exposition of gathering data or showing how you pulled everything together, you've got to go through a ton of slides that just, it, it bores you to talk about it. You know, maybe it's going to be boring the audience as well. Chances are, though, if it's boring you, it's boring them too. And so you can use something flashy or snappy to catch everyone back up into what you're doing. Do it after you're done with the boring stuff, though, or you'll lose them all again. Now, we've got our presentation together because you've brought all this stuff together. But you're not really done yet because now it's time to rehearse. I want you to take your presentation and give it to yourself. Run through it and record yourself. Now, maybe you'll say, I don't want to record myself. I understand. I don't want to record myself either. And above all, I'm not going to listen to myself after I've recorded myself. To that end, I'm so happy that my Mac at home has a speech-to-text app that I use. And so as I go through my presentation on my PC laptop, my Mac is capturing what I'm speaking to. And by doing that, I'm catching up on what's wrong, what's right, how my flow is going, how everything comes together, and as I do this, I make my notes. What needs to change on this slide? Did I forget something that I need to add here? Did I touch on a key point that I wanted to make or did I skip over it? Is the flow in the right order? Maybe I need to start moving slides around. And remember I mentioned that agenda changed. It changed because my flow wasn't right. I realized that there were things that needed to be ordered in a different way in order to make the most sense. And so you start moving those around, but don't do it until you're done with that first time rehearsal because then you've got everything all together for you and you can do it all at once. It moves a lot more quickly. Do that by using your notes like that. And then also take that speech to text app and pull out the key points and put them down here. 
in PowerPoint, there is a display method that you can use that will allow you to put notes next to your slides. And I'll show you how to use that in a second if, if you're not familiar with it. And it also reminded me on this particular slide, take some time and familiarize yourself with PowerPoint because it's really worth it to make sure that you understand what it can do because it does a lot more than simply allows you to construct slides. You can do things like embed videos directly from that program using your webcam, things like that. And it really pays to know what all you can do with it. And I promise it won't take that long. I know we're busy, but it really won't take that long. Now that you've done your first time rehearsal, it's time to do it the second time. And for this, it's a really good idea to get a second monitor. Because if you have two monitors, one monitor is going to show the presentation that we're looking at right now. And the second monitor is going to show you the presenter's view. The presenter's view has a timer at the top right there. That timer is so helpful as you're putting your presentation together and rehearsing it because it lets you know if you're making the time that you need to make. Generally, you need to have your presentation done by a certain time. In fact, in the AOCS annual meeting, that time is 20 or 40 minutes. And the best way to really irritate your chairperson and your audience is to go over time. So don't do that. Make sure that you stay on time and, in fact, leave time for questions. And that timer is so helpful in your rehearsal, making sure you do it. And once you know your flow and the way that things should roll, you can take that time and even put it in your notes, which is underneath that. There we go. This is where your notes go. Those notes that I just mentioned about putting in with your slides, they will show up right here. So you don't want to put paragraphs and paragraphs. You won't be able to read that. But you do want to put your key points, maybe like some bullet points, things to make sure that you're going to hit what you want to hit. And the other thing that you see on this presenter screen is that you see that second slide, the next slide that's coming up. This way you get to anticipate what's, what's about to happen. And by doing that, you can now couch the presentation such that one slide flows into the next and you don't have individual slides of individual pieces of information. In other words, you've got a story that flows. And as you're doing this, the last thing is you're speaking out loud. You want to speak out loud because you want to practice what it sounds like. Because I guarantee you, as we probably all know, a lot of times things that sound great in our heads sound horrible when they come out of our mouths. So you want that to come out of your mouth, you want to listen to it, and you want to make sure that you're comfortable speaking these words that go with the presentation. And part of showing that you're comfortable doing that is speak deeply. I have, I'd say, a mid-range voice. I try to lower it when I'm giving a presentation. Why? Because for some weird reason, people find deeper voices to be a little bit more comforting a little bit more trustful, a little bit more friendly. I'm not saying people with high voices have anything wrong with them. I'm just telling you that's how, again, that's how we're wired. And so as a result, if you lower your voice, you're going to have a better chance of bringing the audience into what you're talking about. Now, are we going to rehearse it a third time? You know, actually, I think that's a really good idea. And the way that you want to rehearse it this time is with an audience, because in fact, those first two rehearsals were not rehearsals at all. They were you getting your presentation together. The first rehearsal, remember, was about getting your t slides all straightened out. The second rehearsal was about getting your tools configured properly. This third rehearsal is when you get your friends or family or strangers off the street, anybody that you know, you get them into a room or you get them onto the couch and you give your presentation to them. A really good idea is if you've got a work group or a research group that you are a part of and you guys are all sharing the same information or you're working on similar projects, get together with them and they probably got research, op uh, sorry, presentation opportunities too. See if you can put together a group where you guys give your presentations to each other. And that way you've got a ready-made rehearsal group you can prepare together, 
And these guys are going to be, hopefully, friendly, supportive, and they're not going to make you feel uncomfortable. They're going to give you some, bad, uh, some value uh, in their feedback. But do remember that because they're working in the same area that you're working in, chances are good they won't need the kind of exposition and clarity that a general audience will. So if they say, hey, you know what, you went over this topic and you really didn't need to, take that with a grain of salt. Think about what you need to give a general audience, but use them for a good rehearsal audience. So, one last thing that I'm going to touch on in terms of rehearsing, and it's completely selfish. It's because if you're not an experienced presenter and you haven't practiced, it's going to become clear very quickly. And it makes me feel very uncomfortable to be sitting into, in an audience and watching someone flounder up on the podium as they try to explain what they've done for the past year. And it, the terrible thing is, you know they know what they're talking about, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But oftentimes, they look like they don't. And as a result, you can't follow them. You have a hard time. I don't know if everyone can see that, but apparently I'm being paged by my support chemist. Sorry about that. And so, and I can't make it go away. Uh, well, we'll just deal with Stephanie. All right, so anyway, you want to make sure that you are... Wow, dealing with technical difficulties. And actually, you know what? That is something that I meant to address. And I'm so glad that I now have the opportunity to because I completely forgot about it. And that is what happens when you have technical difficulties in the middle of your presentation. The answer to it is you point it out. If you try to pretend that nothing has happened, then you're basically making it even more glaring. But if you point out that something has happened and you said, oh, gosh, look, this has happened. We're going to deal with it, though, you put everybody at ease. And it allows things to move on ahead quickly, and you're done with it. And now I'm going to try and move down. There we go. I don't know why. Uh, oh, well, anyway. Now it's time to make the presentation. And at this point, I am going to go ahead and switch on the webcam so that you guys can see me talking about what we're doing. So you're here at the, at the podium, let's say. First thing you do, step up, take a deep breath. If you are fine with what you're doing, if you have no problems with discomfort, if you think this is the most wonderful thing in the world and you can't wait to start talking, don't worry about the deep breath. You're good to go. If you are a little concerned, the deep breath helps. It just helps relax. And whether you're concerned or not, the next thing is that what you want to do is step up to the stand and get the microphone. I'm assuming there's going to be a microphone there. You want to use it. If it's on a podium or a stand, make sure you adjust it. Make sure it's in your position and you're speaking into the microphone. While you're speaking, don't keep turning away. You must speak into the microphone. Otherwise, the volume goes up and down and becomes problematic for people to listen to you. One of the better options, if it's available, is to use something called a lavalier or a lapel mic, which goes onto your jacket. You put that on your jacket, remember to turn it on, <laughs> make sure that it's on, and in fact, tap that microphone in front of you to make sure that it's on, and then speak, keeping your head within about 30 degrees either direction. Again, if you turn completely one way or the other, you're moving your mouth away from the microphone. If no microphone is there, speak loudly. Speak as loudly as you can. Don't scream, but speak loudly. Speak from your diaphragm or your chest. If there's a microphone available and you feel like you don't need it, use it anyway. The reason why is I guarantee you there's going to be someone in the audience who's hard of hearing or they're going to pretend that they're hard of hearing just to tweak you. 
So make sure you use the microphone if you can. And make use of props. I don't mean like Gallagher using a sledgehammer and a watermelon. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to consider everything around you, which is a part of the show. Let's call it the show now, because you're up and you're making your presentation. You want to be dressed well. You want to wear a tie. Now, I'm not wearing a tie because I'm not giving a technical presentation. Generally, when you're going in to give a technical presentation, you're going into academia, you're going into industry, you're going into an area which is typically more conservative than the rest of the world is, and it tends to be more formal too. If you see me at AOCS in St. Louis, you will notice that I'm probably going to be dressed like this for most of the time that I'm there. But when I am on stage or when I'm at the podium, I'm going to have a tie on. And the reason why is because, unfortunately, people are going to judge you on your appearance. And if you look like you're not serious about what you're presenting, then they're not going to take you as seriously. Now, the other props I'm talking about, they're your hands. So you're going to use your hands because you want to motion. You want to use a laser pointer. You want to point at things on the screen. Remember what I said about movement. The other thing is your body conveys a sense of excitement and a sense of awareness. I am interested in this. I really want to give this to you, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it by presenting in this manner. I am not going to read to you. Please don't ever read notes. If you need to look down quickly to get something, that's great. But typically, you don't want to read notes because, again, it looks like you don't know what you're doing, or it looks like you're not interested in it. Now, this is how you make use of your props. Remember these five things. You've got your movement. You've got your enthusiasm. This is how you mean that you want to do it. You've got your inclusion. And this is how you address your audience. Use we a lot. Welcome them with your overall demeanor, and show that you're confident by moving around. If you don't need a podium, don't use it. If you can walk around with your lapel mic, I strongly encourage you to do that because that means that you're covering the front part of the room. You're showing people that you're down here with them and you want to bring them into your world of what you're working with. This is how you make those connections. When you're talking to the audience, look at them. I know a lot of acting and things like that, they talk about how you should look in the, at the back wall or something like that. Never acknowledge the audience. This is not acting. This is you giving. So you want to make sure that you look straight at the audience. You want to make sure that you actually even make eye contact with people if they seem open to it. But while you're doing that, also notice, are they smiling? Are they nodding? Do they have a puzzled expression on their face? And sometimes a puzzled expression means they're thinking. Sometimes a puzzled expression means, I don't know what you're talking about. And that, if you see that look on a lot of people, that means you need to go deeper. It means you need to really explain what's happening and what you're trying to get across. Are people getting up and walking out? Hopefully, maybe one or two only, because they just remembered they've got an appointment somewhere or something like that. But if you start to see a number of people walking out, uh, it could just be there's another session that they need to get to, but it could also be that you're being a little listless. If you're paying attention to the point that you note it, though, chances are good that's not what's happening. Now, if you've got friends and acquaintances in the audience, exclude them from the audience scan. They're there for help and support. They're not there to learn. They're probably learning. But my point is, they're not the ones that you're trying to make sure they get it. And take a break if you need to let them think. Meaning, if it looks like people are really taking in what you've just presented, take a few moments. Speaking of which, take a break if you need to. There's nothing wrong with it. You've gotten to a point, suddenly, I'm thirsty. I'm going to take a sip of water. Nobody needs to know that's actually a break. They may just think that you need to clear your throat so that you can actually continue to talk. 
take a sip of water, breathe in and out, smile at the audience like you just thought of something, oh yeah, I want to tell you about that. But if you need to take a moment because you notice that your heart is racing and you're breathing hard and you're having a hard time getting the words to come out of your mouth because you're forcing it or you're going too fast, that's when you need to take a break. And it's, like I said, it's not a big deal. As you're going through your presentation, I want you to also emphasize points with questions. And I'll, I am going to read these bullets because I think these are great questions to use in the middle of your presentation. Do you see why this was interesting? Do you see why this is interesting? What's that peak about? So how do we go about measuring this? Or why would we think that would have that response? Oh, wow, what just happened there? These are all things that you can, again, use to bring the audience in and help them to help you, in a theoretical sense, figure out what's going on. Because if we learn ourselves, if we teach ourselves, then we're going to retain this a lot better. And then you want to close the presentation. How do you close a presentation? It's really simple. You go to the next slide where it says, in summary, that's all you really have to do. Don't worry about trying to tie things up in a neat note. You've got a slide or two that's going to do it for you. And I, rem I think of this all the time whenever I'm trying to get off the phone with someone. Do you feel like everybody keeps saying goodbye and you, you can't get yourself to hang up the phone? Don't be like that when you're presenting. Instead, simply say, in summary, here's what I have just told you. And I'm not going to go through all that. I mean, I think that we've made it pretty clear. But if you want to go ahead and go through these bullet points, I encourage you not to read them. I encourage you to put them behind uh, in terms of what you're actually saying. You want to make presentations because it will benefit you. You want to have the ideas of what you're going to present fixed in your head before you go ahead and put the slides together. You want to simplify putting those slides together by first laying out an agenda, and then you want to polish the presentation. And if you need a second page, that's fine. You can use a second page. You want to rehearse all of this, but above all, you want to display a sense of confidence. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking about, and I know what this means. So closing the presentation, it's simply the key points. Keep it simple and brief. It shouldn't be complicated, not if you've done your job. And remember, the audience is going to have access to this. So make sure that they know how to get it. And the last thing after you close it down is to say thanks. Always make sure you thank the people that have helped you get to this particular point because, number one, it's a nice thing. Number two, they appreciate it. And number three, they're going to be more likely to ask you to come back or to work with them again if you are kind enough to point out that these are the people that help me get where I am. And so I want to make sure that I say thank you very much to Ivonic for letting me take the time to do this presentation and share this information with you. And I also, of course, want to thank the AOCS for asking me to do it. It, it is absolutely a joy to work with them. Um, and I appreciate, again, Amy, that, that the, the couple of nice additions to your, to your intro for me. Um, the AOCS is a wonderful organization, and if you're not involved with them, I hope that you do, do get involved with them. And lastly, Alan Earnshaw, our Ivonic IT guru, who made sure that this all connected properly and works the way that it should, thanks to him as well. And with that, my resources are here. And, oh, by the way, David Schewing, one of his charts, I used that, and you'll notice that there's not a super special uh, formatted way of mentioning his presentation. I simply said what it was. Uh, that's all you got to do. And with that, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Rick. That was a very thorough uh, presentation. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, and I, I really appreciate it and uh, would love to have you back. So thank you and thank you to Alan and Ivonic. Um, if any attendees have a question, you can uh, put it in the chat box um, to the right of your screen and we can make sure that um, Rick answers those. 
and I'm just scrolling through. It looks like Alan Payne, who's going to be one of our next webinar presenters, found this quite useful in regards to the images and um, the timing. So awesome. And so he says, I've sometimes found it useful when timing is tight to fully script a presentation. I've done this for the webinar on the 10th of April, where it will be easy to read the notes. What do you think of that? I think you're absolutely right. Actually, I, in fact, I'll tell you, uh, when I mentioned how I use the, uh, use the uh, speech to text app on the Mac, that's exactly what it turns into. It's not, I don't just stop with having that there and then using it for review. What I do is that I then go back and actually edit it because all the typos drive me nuts. Um, and, and I think that's actually a good idea. I was even thinking about it, and it's interesting you brought, brought that up, as, uh, as I was doing it for a different presentation that was for our sales force, I thought, you know what, this might be really helpful if I actually put it into the notes and then sent out note slides. There's a way to print those out or save those to PDF on PowerPoint. So I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Rick? I'll give everyone a second. I have a question. Rick, this is Scott Bloomer. I'm the Director of Technical Services here at ALCS. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I think you, uh, obviously you're very polished and very experienced, but you weren't always like that, I'm sure. And I see these people that, that are giving presentations and, and they, they have such a struggle with their confidence. Maybe they're speaking in a foreign language. I always admire, you know, somebody from Japan or China or someplace else that is giving a presentation in English. Do you have any advice for maybe a sort of a mental script that people can go through as they're preparing to enhance their confidence? Uh, any tips for that? Yes, actually, I, I'm a big believer in body, uh, in your body positioning, actually. And that, you know what, I didn't mention some of the ideas I had because I could see where the time was going. And so I, <laughs> I slipped through a couple of things. But yet, smiling. I, I mentioned smiling is, is a big thing. It's not just a big thing to the audience because they feel like you're welcoming, welcoming and, and, and you know what you're talking about and you're confident. It's because it gives you that sense of confidence. And so as you're... Um, as you're actually giving the, the presentation, you know, go up, you know, put your body in, the, in the, the way that you would stand if you were on top of the world and you were just absolutely ready to go. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of times the feedback that comes back through the body gives you that sense. And then once you have it under your belt and you've given that presentation, you go, hey, that wasn't so bad. And especially if you have done a good job, you know, we love to see younger people coming up and presenting like that because we were there once too, just like you said. And and so that helps to feed it all in and it becomes a continuous cycle. So I think that's where it first starts is, you know, act like you really are confident, but from there, allow yourself to really start building on that with, with the interaction with others. Thank you. Thank you. So another question we have is, how do you deal with a heckler in the audience? You know, I saw that come up, and I, I was wondering if the, the person who wrote that question was specifically speaking about him. I guess he really did mean that. Okay, in answer to that question, uh, generally the best way to do it is just say, oh, you don't know what you're, no, I'm kidding. You, no, generally the best way is to be respectful. And in fact, I saw something um, I saw something happen at one of our annual meetings, as a matter of fact, in which someone who honestly was a giant in this particular area of research called a graduate student on something she presented. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't unkind, um, but he pointed out, you did not understand this concept. And, you know, which to me would be a devastating blow, you know, from the guy who actually put it together. Um, and what she, how she responded was respectfully and honestly in saying, well, these were the assumptions that we made and we took this approach with it. And if you think that we're wrong about this, you know, please let's talk about it and see how we can learn from what we've done wrong. 
you know, that's that's really the best way to do it. And honestly, in research, that's the way we're going to want to do it anyway. Uh, but never rise to a bait. If someone is actually going to say something, and, and I, thankfully I've never seen this, but it could always happen. If someone comes up and says, how can you bring this presentation in front of us when you clearly don't understand what you're talking about? You know, the best response is to say, I've done the best I can. This is, to the best of my ability, what I've put together, and I'm sorry if it doesn't meet your expectations. But if you engage a heckler, then you're simply feeding them. And, and it's best simply to say, you know, this is, this is the way it is, and, and there's nothing more I can say than that. And then, so we have another question coming through. Is, do you have any advice on how to catch the interest of everyone in the audience if they are not from a similar background? Yes, and that is, that's those first two minutes. That is when you say, first of all, let me tell you about some of the concepts that we're working on. And if they're not all from the same, benef uh, same background, I actually put it into two steps. First, let's talk about the basic concepts. Now I'm going to tell you what I thought was interesting. If they're not all from the same, you know, same background, though, what you can say is, I found something interesting. Let me tell you about this that I saw behave in this manner. Let me tell you the reason why we understand their, the behavior. It acts like this and it acts like this. And by doing so, you're starting to give that little background information, but you've also caught them right with the very first hook of, I found something interesting. And if you have an application in mind, if you say, here's something that can feed the world, here is something that can improve the output of a plant by up to 50%, then that is something where you're going to catch a lot of people's interest regardless of where they are. And then you can bring them into the rest of the talk from that point. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And this one is, I always have doubts about the amount of slides. For a 45-minute presentation, for example, I use 30 slides. I don't like presentations where the presenter keeps changing the slide many times. It bothers me. But I do not know if that's a particular taste. What is better? That, that's a really good question, too. And, and really, you know, I think it's truly up to you. There are some rules of thumb I've seen out there. You should take this much time for slide or a slide should spend this much time on the screen or something like that. I, I don't think that's right. Uh, in fact, I think that if you've got a lot of information on a given slide, then what you want to do is spend time on that and expose that information. Give, give it all out. And even if that takes five or ten minutes along with your asides, as long as that slide is backing you up, leave it there. The, um, the quick movement through slides a lot of times may be when someone realizes that they have misjudged their timing. And that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure that you do your second rehearsal with your timing. You want to make sure that you understand where your slide should be, because that way you, you don't get to that point where you start uh, uh, flipping through slides a little bit more quickly. And to be honest, and I will be absolutely honest, I did that. Um, towards the end of my presentation, you'll notice that I moved a little bit more quickly, and that was because looking at the clock and seeing how much time we had left, I realized I'd spent a little bit more time than I had intended to up front, and I needed to move, move more quickly on the back end. Sometimes it just happens. But I think the best thing is let your conversation dictate your slides, not the other way around. Well, thank you again, Rick, for this presentation. Um, absolutely fantastic. And thank you for everyone that took the time to join us for Webinar Wednesday. And I hope you found this helpful. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again uh, for the next one. Thank With you very that, much. Amy. Yes, thank you. And uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day.